Thank you for um, coming on for a COVID conversation. I'm just about to add in Justin. I see him there in the green room ready to join us. And, uh, you know, thank you for all of you for your um, comments and everything that you've been contributing to the Lifeguard Authority group. It's been great to see all the different ideas and courses. I want to throw some special shout outs to the Redwoods group. They're doing a chat on Thursdays and there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are coming out to that where they're talking about different things coming up in the industry and taking questions and bringing in different perspectives and thoughts. Um, Katie Crysdale, I want to say big thank you to you with the Kool-Aid series. Um, she's been putting this together. It's not easy to get that up and running. So um, like twice a week, I believe it is. She's got lots going on. So check out Lakeview Aquatic Consulting. Jen, um, our team member with Lifeguard Authority is going to be putting some links as we go through the chat in the box for you guys to link to that. And uh, to all of the agencies out there that are putting some content out and supporting us in the industry, thank you for that. I um, am excited that we have Justin here. I was welcomed to um, listen in on one of the conversations that Starguard Elite was having with their clients. And Justin was taking questions and helping them. And this type of direction and information is really helpful to us. So I wanted to say great work on that. Um, Justin, I know you can hear me. We've had over 500 people join this group just knowing that you're coming to chat. So that's been that's been great. So I'm going to add you up here, Justin, so we can get going. And you're coming online. So this is Justin, Dr. Justin Samsrat. I hope I'm saying your last name right. I always call you Dr. Justin. And uh, you are a medical director with Stargard Elite. You are a practicing ER physician. Can you update us on um, how you're filling your time and your career to give us a little bio background on you? Yeah, absolutely. So welcome. Thank you guys very much for uh, for joining. Just a couple of quick things before we start. Joey, so I've got my share screen. Are you able to swap between those when uh, when the time comes for the presentation? Yeah, we'll do a quick test. Okay. So we have it up now and then I'll take me off. Great. So as long as you're able to see it right now, because once it goes full screen on mine, then I can't see any uh, any of you guys. But if uh, we're good with that. Was that all good, Joey? Yeah. All right. So and then the other note, when I do get into the uh, the presentation, um, I'm going to have a lot of links in there to the original source documentation, which I know that Joey and Jen are going to share later. But for every one of them, there's also a QR code. So if you have an iPhone, all you have to do is point your phone at the screen and it'll take you to that link. You can either do it in real time or when Joey makes the PDF of this presentation available afterwards, then you'll be able to just point your screen at it. For some Android phones, you have to download a separate QR code reader app. But for the iPhone, you just open your camera like you're going to take a picture, and as you move it in closer, then um, then it'll uh, it'll do that. So I'll I'll pause on everything with the QR code for long I, enough for you guys I, to to join. Phone for the win. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh, without further ado, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Justin Sumson. I'm an ER doctor by uh, by trade. I started out as a beach lifeguard in Jacksonville Beach, Florida in 1996 and have always been focused on, um, on drowning prevention, rescue and uh, treatment. I'm a co-founder of the International Drowning Researchers Alliance and founder of Lifeguards Without Borders, and I serve as medical director for, uh, for Starguard Elite. And in addition to being board certified as an emergency medicine doctor, I also have subspecialty training in pre-hospital and disaster me uh, medicine. So I've been working with disaster management agencies through natural disasters and, um, and other things for quite some time. So really kind of dealing with the pandemic from the frontline perspective is really what I've, I've trained my my entire uh, career for. So I work in an emergency department in a small rural area as well as supporting um, infrastructure in other areas. And overall, we've been seeing kind of decreased in number of people coming to the emergency departments across the country as people shelter in place and they're not leaving bars drunk and getting into fights and stabbing each other and, uh, and such. There's less injuries that are occurring 
Um, but the people that we are seeing tend to uh, tend to be sicker. And especially with the COVID patients, they're winding up um, in the ICU and in the inpatient units for longer periods of time than is typical for the flu. So most hospitals are bursting at the seams upstairs, but relatively uh, decreased volume downstairs. Sorry. <laughs> so um, Justin, Thank you um, for being here. And I just want to get this in near the beginning. Thank you for the work you're doing on the front line. We were talking on the pre-show about all of these frontline workers and what they're doing. Before we get into the details of you know, aquatics and what's going on, can you just give us an update of what life's looking like for you day to day with your job and what's going on daily for you? Yeah, I would say that um, with the, the decreased volumes, we're still seeing sicker patients, but probably the, uh, the hardest part is a lot of the uncertainty because even as we're getting into allergy season, there's a lot of people with, with a cough. There's a lot of people with uh, symptoms that could mimic an early uh, COVID infection. And having to put on all of the PPE before you go into a room and then take it off is uh, is taxing uh, because it's 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 something that's in the air. It's something that's on surfaces that we touch and that we can't see, and so we don't really know um, who's necessarily has it and doesn't because testing is still taking several days to uh, to get results. So everything is is really being done in hindsight. And probably what's been the hardest thing for uh, for me that I didn't expect to affect me as much is the decreased in visitors to the hospital. Uh, appropriately, everybody is social distancing and in the hospital, that means no visitors. So if it's somebody's mom, sister, dad, brother, aunt, uncle, or grandparent that might be having a stroke, that might be having a heart attack, that has something else that's, that's going on, they are alone. Their family members are not there by their side. And sometimes we have to, um, to talk to them via FaceTime, to have very difficult discussions. And, um, and that um, has really emotionally affected me more than, than I had anticipated. We rely heavily on, um, on people in their times of need to have their family close there to hold their hand. And uh, we're not able to do that right now. Yeah, that's tough. So um, I know you have the presentation um, prepared. I, I just want to talk about facts like you and we're hearing from you the reality we're hearing different realities of what people are saying on the media there's so many different facts about COVID going around it's hard to tell what's true what's not you know the world of the media now it's, it's so difficult so what what are the facts um, that you think we need to be knowing that you know we can we can look to to help us make decisions in our personal lives, but then also in the scope of our professional realm. Yeah, first and foremost, um, it's definitely a very real virus. It exists and it was naturally occurring. Uh, coronaviruses are common and they're common in people and in animals, just like the flu is common in people and animals. And sometimes it spontaneously mutates. It wasn't because of um, somebody eating a bat or like anything uh, crazy like that. It just unfortunately was a, was a natural thing and it is spreading person to person. And there's a long asymptomatic period for some people it's up to um, uh, 11 to 14 days where you can feel 100% normal and not have symptoms and continue to spread it. But typical is about five days and, uh, and then you start to show symptoms. Most infections are minimally symptomatic, um, but in people with uh, comorbidities, such as obesity, hypertension, heart disease, uh, asthma, underlying lung problems, that they are at, at increased risk. And I hear a lot of talk about, oh, well, they had comorbidities, they were gonna be sick anyways. All of those comorbidity, comorbidities that I just listed are all increased risk factors for dying in a car collision. But if you hadn't gotten into a car collision that day, you wouldn't have died. And so uh, a lot of this discussion seems to try and minimize it. And I don't want everybody to be afraid, but everybody should be cautious. And the effects of social distancing have been profound and significantly uh, flattened the curve. And 
we collectively appreciate that. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to switch you to your screen and let's jump into your update. And then uh, I've got some questions for you after as well. So I'm going to. All right. Thank you, Joey. And I'll just be about 15 minutes on this. I can't see any. And then we'll open it up for questions. And I can't see any of the, the stream or Joey waving at me. So if I get dropped, then just send me a text. And then uh, we'll address the questions uh, afterwards. So thank you, guys. Again, I don't have any financial conflicts with any of the information provided. Follow your own local protocols and, um, and medical direction. And uh, again, these are my affiliations, but no financial conflicts with any of the information provided. So the uh, coronavirus is spread by contact, droplet, and airborne uh, transmission. Contact means uh, somebody sneezes on their hand, somebody coughs on their hand, they touch a doorknob, it stays on that, uh, that doorknob, and then so the next person touches it. And it can live on uh, smooth, flat, metal plastic surfaces for as much as five or more days. And that's why the emphasis on cleaning things. Droplets are the big gobs. So when somebody sneezes and you can see that gunk that would stick to something, those are droplets. Those don't travel very far and very quickly drop down onto the ground. But what has made the coronavirus more challenging is what's called airborne uh, uh, transmission, which I love here referred to as small floaty droplets instead of heavy wet droplets. And those can hover around in the air for, uh, for as much as three hours. And so this was actually from Ebola, this, uh, this uh, infographic. But you can think of, again, those wet, heavy droplets as something that you would be able to see. But the airborne could be somebody coughing in a room and then leaving that room and the virus stays suspended there for three hours. We already do a good job with contact precautions by wearing gloves and making sure that we wash our hands if we touch blood or other infectious uh, fluids. The droplet, direct droplet stuff isn't as concerning because again, that's something that we can usually see and wash off. So this whole idea of airborne contact is really what requires the, uh, the nuanced approach that, uh, that I know is causing a lot of, uh, of anxiety for, uh, for lifeguards and lifeguard uh, agencies. So ILCOR is the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and very briefly, American Heart Association, European Resuscitation Council, Asia Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, and all of those agencies were regional agencies worldwide get together and form this committee that's ILCOR. ILCOR within it has uh, scientific treatment recommendations that they put out. Then each individual regional agency such as AHA or ERC then make their guidelines based on that. And the they're usually pretty consistent, but sometimes there's small variation. For example, for CPR for drowning, the American Heart Association went with just giving two breaths. European Resuscitation Council went with five breaths. The overall ILCOR guidance that they derived it from said give two to five breaths, and then each individual agency or a regional agency comes up with that. So they looked at is doing CPR on people with COVID-19 a risk to the uh, to the rescuer. And their recommendations was that chest compressions and CPR have the potential to generate aerosols. That's that small floaty droplets. So with that in mind, their recommendations for lay rescuers, lay rescuers, not you guys, you guys are healthcare professionals. Um, that you consider chest compression only and public uh, access uh, defibrillation, that it's okay to defibrillate people, it's okay to do compression only CPR, because even in the midst of a pandemic, people having um, regular heart attacks, so to speak, are still going to be the most common. And that the risk of children and infant transmission of um, coronavirus is relatively low. So we, it's okay to, uh, to give them uh, breaths. 
So now for you guys, for healthcare professionals doing CPR on known or suspected COVID patients, we suggest you use PPE for aerosol generating procedures, such as chest compressions and rescue breathing. Again, this is specific to COVID patient, known COVID patients and for healthcare providers to consider defibrillating before putting on your PPE, because again, if this is a regular old out of hospital cardiac arrest in somebody with uh, COVID, then you can consider just def trying to defibrillate them first while you put everything else on, because defibrillation doesn't generate the same amount of aerosol as chest compressions. So then from this, then the American Heart Association, I know we have an international uh, audience, but uh, I'm gonna focus on the AHA guidelines, is they put out interim guidance for basic and advanced life support in adult children and neonates with suspected or confirmed. And it's really important distinction that this is for suspected or confirmed, because even in the hospital, we're not doing anything different for CPR from trauma. We're not doing anything different for CPR for drowning. We're only making these changes on known or suspected COVID. So I'm going to show you kind of what the far extreme of this would be, and that is for somebody known or suspected to uh, to have COVID. And the very first thing in verifying scene safety, the very beginning of the algorithm is to put on PPE and limit the number of people that go in the room. And so that means not having the extra medical student, not having the respiratory therapy student and all of those other people in there, but also allowing for a delay in initiation of care to put on all of the appropriate PPE. This is analogous to our firefighters. We don't expect them to go into the burning building without first putting on their PPE to protect them. So we accept that the building might burn for a couple extra minutes while the firefighters are putting on their equipment. And so this allows us to kind of have that flexibility. And then for no normal breathing, but they have a pulse, respiratory distress only, provide rescue breathing with a BVM, with a filter and a tight seal. The tight seal we should have been doing uh, all along. And the filter is a small five or $6 device that just goes in line with the uh, with the BVM to filter their expired air because as that air comes back out for their exhalation, it's going into the bag and has the potential to aerosolize everywhere else in the room. Everything else in the algorithm is exactly the same. It's just you should be using a good seal, which we should have been doing all the, all along. Now we're just adding in the use of that viral filter. And then for unconscious, no pulse, we're going to do our normal 30 to two using a BVM with a filter and a tight seal or continuous compressions with passive oxygenation using a face mask, which in out of hospital cardiac arrest for a lot of EMS agencies, they've been doing for years. Again, that's not specific to drowning. That is just regular old out of hospital uh, cardiac arrest is something that's been done for uh, for quite some time. Specific to the aquatics industry, mouth to mask is just as aerosol generating as a BVM. And nobody really outside of a lot of the aquatics industry makes a distinction between BVM and mouth to mask because everywhere else along the EMS chain uses BVMs. But I don't think that this is going to replace acceptable use of mouth to uh, to mask plus or minus a filter with a good seal. Where I do see us um, adapting and changing is really emphasizing that proper seal. So that might mean when we're doing CPR, we have one person that's dedicated to using two hands to make a good mask seal while the other person provides breaths instead of the person giving breaths also trying to, to do a good mask seal. And this is something that I've advocated for for years with doing a proper jaw thrust to lift the, the face to the mask instead of pushing the, uh, the mask down. And the question that I keep getting the most is when can we train and when can we open? And that is going to vary significantly based on the region that, uh, that you're in. 
So the CDC has a very comprehensive interim guidance for businesses and employers that talks about good best practices, making sure people don't come to work sick, making sure employees are comfortable saying that they're sick and they can't come in without risk of losing their job so they don't hide symptoms, making sure that we're cleaning and disinfecting areas uh, regularly. And I encourage you all to read through this. And the structure of the CDC, at least within the US, is that they just provide high level guidance. What they say isn't the law. What they say isn't the rules. Each individual jurisdiction, each individual state, county, or even facility or agency basically looks to the CDC guidelines and says, here's what really applies to me. Here's what doesn't necessarily apply to our situation. And then you develop your own local best practice based on this overall guidance. So it's not that everybody has to implement absolutely everything that the CDC says. It merely means we don't want everyone to have to reinvent the wheel. So here's the big picture guidance that is available uh, out there. And this just came out uh, yesterday. And... Um, what, for the guidelines for trying to open up businesses again. And what it comes down to is that it is going to be state or regional specific. And it's basically a decrease for two straight weeks of flu-like illnesses and COVID-like uh, cases. The numbers of COVID cases that you see reported for county states are a significant underestimation. We are not really counting very many of the actual COVID cases because of lack of testing ability. And so we have a lot of people who are diagnosing with COVID without ever actually having done a test. And so this allows to, uh, to account for those. And then also a downward trajectory of documented cases or positive tests over a two week uh, period. And so those are easier numbers to follow. The more difficult one that is going to be specific to your area is that hospitals are not using crisis care and robust testing in place for at-risk healthcare workers, including emerging, emerging antibody testing. So some notes real quick on testing. The nasal swab is a PCR test, polymerase chain reaction, which basically tries to scoop up some of the viral RNA and then amplifies it to say, yes, the RNA of that virus is present. Antigen testing is a blood test that says, yes, the virus is circulating in the, in the blood and we can detect it. Antibody testing is testing for your body's response, meaning have you been exposed to the viral antigen and now you're providing antibodies against it. The antibody testing doesn't mean you have active infection, but that you have recovered from an infection and as we move forward in years to come, I think it might be similar to hepatitis B, where you either show documentation of antigens because, I'm sorry, antibodies because you've already had it, or a vaccine um, that, uh, that protects you uh, against it. And so when can I open my specific facility will be based on that. And when you do, when everybody does open, we still may have some degree of social distancing, which is difficult in the recreational community like water parks and uh, aquatic centers. Temperature checks, uh, I think, may become a reality for guests at the facility. But for me, a lot of it comes down to for testing employees, if your employees are feel ill, they should have an open forum to be able to tell you that they feel ill. The temperature checks really help identify people that might be hiding their symptoms or don't want to say that they, uh, that they don't feel well. And then the testing isolation and contact tracing is if somebody does test positive, who did they work with? Who have they been around? And then making sure that, um, that those people are uh, appropriately isolated as well. So with those two week criteria, it takes two weeks to get to phase one, and then you have to be in phase one for two weeks to get to phase two, and then in phase two for two weeks to get to phase three. 
And for me, most aquatic centers or uh, recreational facilities fall into the category either of gyms or large venues. So after you've had a two week decrease, you can open if you adhere to strict physical distancing and essentially no more than 10 people at a time that aren't physically separated by more than six feet. Phase two is going to be uh, 50 people instead of uh, 10 and then closing the common areas. And then phase three is when you are able to resume unrestricted staffing of, uh, of work sites and then continuing the sanitation protocols. And so the standard chlorination is enough to kill the coronavirus in the water. The concern is more in the locker room, in the break room, in those other areas where, uh, where people uh, congregate and aggregate. And a quick note on masks that I didn't mention during the, uh, the droplets and the aerosols is that N95 and higher masks filter what's being inhaled so what you're breathing in and it filters out the virus to protect the person that's wearing it. The cloth masks, scarves, homemade masks that everybody is recommended to wear at all times out in public right now keeps your exhalation from hovering in the air for three hours. And so me wearing a mask when I go out and about in public just a, a homemade mask doesn't really benefit me specifically, but if everybody wears masks, it helps benefit everybody because those people who are asymptomatic for five to 14 days aren't exhaling their infected breath to hover in the air for three hours. And so wearing masks may just be a social reality for the next 12 to 18 months as uh, as we continue to uh, to get back out there and so it may be that lifeguards managers and people at the facility are wearing masks just as part of that social consciousness and not necessarily uh, because it's protecting them from uh, from risk of uh, of infection so Information is rapidly evolving right now. A lot of this is me kind of reading the tea leaves of, um, of what's out there and what's in the guidance. Obviously, we wanna make sure that our lifeguards are protected and we will train and open when it is safe to do so, but there are no major changes for non-COVID CPR. So right now in the hospital, the paramedics, we are doing the exact same thing for everybody that's not a suspected COVID patient. We only are changing things when it's a known or suspected COVID patient. So for a recreational facility, that might be having a sign out front that says, if you have a fever, if you have a cough, if you've been around somebody within the last two weeks that's a known COVID, you can't come in. This is a private business and we are screening you out at the door to not let you allow into the facility, which may or may include temperature checks as well. But that is going to be the criteria that allows that facility to have uh, a decreased chance. Yes, there's still going to be asymptomatic spread, but that's the reason for the gradual increase in the number of people allowed into some of these uh, recreational uh, facilities. So here is the email address if you have more, uh, more questions. I understand that there will be a lot of them. And so we will try and kind of aggregate them and we may not respond to them individually, rather um, respond with a, another webinar or another document that, uh, that shows more of them. And then because I stole his, uh, his artwork, here is the, uh, the credit for, uh, for the, the pictures that, uh, that I included. So with that, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Joey and hey. answer questions. Perfect, Justin, uh, my mind's just woo, going. So <laughs> thank you for that presentation. I, I know it's answered a lot of questions. I'm just kind of monitoring some of the feed. I've tried to grab some of the questions. I'm gonna facilitate some of these now with you. Please um, throw more of your questions in the chat. We've got a lot of questions about, is this gonna be available? After, yes, this recording will be posted in the Thread of Lifeguard Authority as well. Um, I'm going to post it on our YouTube channel so that you can share the link um, with other people. So that will be available. 
Um, we've had some questions about the slides, the way the setup works. It's covered some of the QR codes. So I'll work with Justin after to um, get links for those resources for everyone. So <clears throat> one thing, um, not as a, a fat question here, is this idea of lay rescuer versus healthcare professional, Justin. Um, and this is, you know, Together 2022, a personal mission to elevate the perception of what we do. The, the, the reality is in many of these communities, people aren't referring to lifeguards as healthcare professionals. They're looking at them at um, the perspective of someone who did a CPR class. What are your thoughts on um, how we need to communicate to our leaders or our organizations so that they're putting us in the right bucket so that these protocols can be more effective? Just show them your CPR card. <laughs> your CPR card says CPR for the professional rescuer. And that's the level, both medical legally, that you are trained to and that, um, that you're expected to respond. And um, yeah, I, I don't know other than having those specific conversations, but lifeguards are professional rescuers. Good, I love hearing that. So a lot of chat about BVMs. So people are asking, are BVMs, should they be mandatory for all lifeguards? I know for most of the world, they're a standard in um, a lot of the certifications, but I know here in Canada, for example, it's not part of the Life Savings National Standard as of now. So should we be getting BVMs in the hands of every lifeguard? Does that make this easier? Lots of questions about BVMs. Can you just elaborate slightly or reinforce some of that for us, please? It, so I'm a big fan of using BVMs and oxygen for lifeguards, and it has nothing to do with COVID. It's, it's easier to deliver effective, consistent, uniform breaths, but it has nothing to do with COVID. Related to COVID, it doesn't matter if you're using a BVM or mouth to, uh, to mask. Okay, great. Um, so we're talking, you talked a little bit about people wearing masks to protect other people. We see that in the media and a lot of other countries um, that people are doing that to stop it at themselves. If I go to work out in a gym, I go to soccer skills and guild, soccer skills and drills or play pickleball, I can wear a mask in a rec center. I can't necessarily wear one while I'm swimming. Um, we had some questions about people wearing masks, you know, during classes and things. Do you see that? potentially being um, different in rec? Like, do you think pools will open staggered later than other components of recreation? Are they different? Can we brush them with the same um, stroke? Yeah, so they, obviously it doesn't make sense for anybody to ever wear a mask while uh, while swimming, um, save for, for snorkeling and, and scuba. And so I don't see that that we would be wearing masks. Because again, when you get home, you're not wearing a mask in the shower. You're not wearing a mask around uh, uh, around your house unless you're known to be sick and trying to protect your your family and quarantining in a separate part of, uh, of your home. And, um, and none of this is going to be perfect when it rolls out, but that is the, the reality. Okay. So um, we had some questions in the chat about in-water breaths. Um, and mass and our kind of our protocols there. Do you have any thoughts on that? So the in-water um, rescue breathing, I think is critical to drowning resuscitation. And that is something that uh, you guys have heard me harping on for, uh, for years. And even as we stand right now, there are limited guidelines. In water rescue breathing is mentioned in the CPR guidelines as something for individual agencies to consider. So there will not be the AHA or any other major national body coming out and saying, here's how to handle in water resuscitation. My sense and what I anticipate that we will do with our clients is that we've screened at the door for known or suspected COVID patients. And now that four-year-old is a very low risk for being a COVID patient. And we are still gonna do rescue breathing in the water with the same masks that we are currently using. And then once they get up on the pool deck, then they may have a mask or they may have the BVM that has the inline filter. That risk is not zero, 
but the risk of transmission of other diseases has always been not zero, but it's something that I've felt strongly about and that we have advocated for to give our drowning patients the best chance of survival. If we are reopening our facilities and worried that every person there has active coronavirus or COVID infection, then we have opened too early. And I heard you saying that a few times before is, there's all these what ifs, should we be spreading them out, change rooms, this, that. If you're having to get really super creative with all of these things, you're opening too soon. Um, a lot of the discussion, Justin, has been around swimming lessons. So I'm demonstrating skills, I'm face to face. Because of the nature of my job, I'm in close contact for teaching swimming lessons. Do you, from your perspective, see the risk different um, from guarding um, obviously, there's the risk of response, but do you think swimming lessons, we can open swimming lessons the same time potentially as our swims? Do you think those are going to be treated slightly differently? Do you have any thoughts on that in a broad stroke? So again, with the guidelines, as we have the tiered opening, it's going to be still maintaining that physical distance and still maintaining that social distancing. So it might be difficult for those smaller age group where you are doing touch supervision to conduct a swim class that meets those guidelines. A lot of the questions that I see of when can we use uh, or when can we resume training? We want to go back to training as normal. And right now there is interim guidance out on if you're going to conduct a training, here's how to do it in a socially distant way. Here's how to decontaminate your mannequins between, uh, between persons. It's difficult to train two-person CPR right now because you've got those two people, you know, right next to each other doing this. But the issue is that we are trying to prevent asymptomatic spread amongst people that absolutely have to be at work right now. Training may not be absolutely having to be at work right now. And so with that phased increase where, you know, you've met that tier one and now you can start bringing some employees back, you're going to be screening those employees. You're gonna be watching them closely for symptoms and um, and then going from there to initiate your training before you open to the public. So that phased response of reopening is really going to guide a lot of that. And I'm seeing a lot of questions on the, the BVM uh, filters. I know they were discussed as well in a, um, in a, a webinar yesterday. And um, there's numerous vendors that make them. I don't have any specific um, recommendation or financial, anything with any of them. Um, they're five or six dollars. They go on any CPR mask. So the Seal Right, uh, the Seal Easy, the Big Easy, all of those masks, it just goes in line with the, uh, with the BVM. It's something that we've been using in the hospitals for years. It's something that we've been using on our tuberculosis patients, that we've been using on people with other bad respiratory illnesses. We use them during flu season every year. It is a common, easy, readily um, available device. Like any other paper-based filter, it doesn't work well when wet. And so that will be just a training consideration for if somebody's vomiting and now they've contaminated their, the filter, well, now your breaths aren't going to go in. You might need to change it out. You might need to roll them. You might need to, to prepare, you know, to, to plan and train for those things. So yeah, that's, that's one of the things that um, I've seen some comments there when guards have their filter on their mask, for example, in Canada, many of our masks come with a filter on it. It, it becomes very hard to get air through that mask um, and that filter. So that's something that I think the industry is gonna have to troubleshoot and moving forward, come up with some creative solutions to that with training. One thing with training that we've seen- right. and so one, one more quick thing on that, uh, on that, Joey, is again, no big international body is gonna come out with in-water rescue breathing guidelines. And for me, if we've screened, known or suspected at the door, and now we have a likely child that we're doing a resuscitation on, then I am still going to advocate for doing rescue breathing in water without using a filter for those first life-saving resuscitative breaths. 
And then when they come out of the water, then that's when we may incorporate for that more prolonged phase of the aerosol generating uh, procedure. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, I just wanted to talk about high performance CPR, this pit crew approach that we've been learning about. Um, we train in that, should we still be training? Should we be making adjustments to like how we're doing that for proximity? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. We should still be moving forward. And one of the things that I may have glossed over um, in that presentation was to reopen, to even get to phase one, your local hospital has to no longer be at crisis standards of care, which means when you're opening you are no longer in crisis standards of care, meaning you are expected to be able to deliver the same high quality CPR, the same standard of care, the same level of chance of survival in your surveillance and in your response when you're performing CPR. If you aren't able to do that, you have opened too early and you're still in crisis standards of care. Okay, good, good note. So we have a question here. I'll throw up here about wouldn't non-systematic people who have COVID not have high temps? Um, I think they're referring to your comment about screening. Absolutely. And from the employee standpoint, when I go to work every day, I get my temperature taken. And the reason is I have known exposure to, to suspected and known COVID patients. I'm around them every day. <laughs> I diagnose them every day. And so there's no way around it that I have been surrounded by this virus. And so I get my temperature taken because the current CDC guidelines are for healthcare workers who have known exposures, but no symptoms. They need to be asked about symptoms every day they go to work and have their temperature taken twice a day. And so every day I go to work, they ask if I have symptoms and they take my temperature twice so that we can catch it as early as possible of me being symptomatic because we don't have enough tests and it's not practical to test me every time I go to my shift and then have the results in three to five days because that's, that's useless. So for screening the general public, you're asking the questions of, hey, have we, uh, have, do you have symptoms? Are you around people? If you are, then you're not allowed in. But some of those people are going to lie about it because they want to go to the water park, damn it. And the taking their temperature helps identify those people. Absolutely, you're going to miss all of the asymptomatic people. Absolutely, you're going to miss all of the people without a fever. That's why there's this phased increase of we're not opening the gates completely all at once. We might start with just staff coming back and doing training. And then we might have limited openings of, um, of other folks. And, um, and so uh, the question of the screening, it's there's one process for employees and then there's a different process for the general public. But the, these same screening questions and guidelines are what 911 uh, or whatever your international equivalent agencies are using. When that call comes in, they're asking, are you, do you know that you have it? Do you suspect that you have it? Do you have any of these symptoms? If yes, then the responding everybody knows to put on PPE before they go into your house. If you say no, then it's business as usual. And that's much more high risk than a lifeguard at a water park or a, an aquatic center. So by using those same guidelines that the 911 agencies are using, we hope to be able to screen out the vast majority of people, but there's still gonna be asymptomatic spread for 24 months until everybody is, uh, is vaccinated or has already had it. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you a question about that. So do you think we're gonna see a reality in the next you know, 12 to 18, 24 months where if I've had it or I've had the vaccine, I might have some type of a visual, and this is purely speculation, but do you think that will be something that we might see in society is to show with, I'm not wearing a mask, but it's okay, people, I'm fine. Is there any thought on that or is that <laughs> far out there? No. I think that's uh, that's a little dystopian for me okay. um, and for most regulatory uh, agencies as well. And 
that was an early part of proposals for, well, let's just let everybody who's already had it get back to work. Well, then people who haven't had it, who want to go back to work are just going to go get it. Yeah. That's good. That's and that, <laughs> that's counterproductive. So here's a question from a training perspective in light of asystematic transmission, what are thoughts on giving actual rescue breaths to lifeguards during training? Right now, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be giving, we shouldn't be doing training that requires physical contact. As of today, we shouldn't be doing um, training that requires physical contact between two guards or between two anybody's. They can't stay six feet apart, save for the in-water rescue portions. I think that those are okay because of the, the nature of being in the water that's, uh, that's chlorinated. Um, but um, yeah, can't do that. Okay, so um, New York we know has shut down, and again, this is purely speculative. Um, do you know like what lead time general organizations might have to know whether or not they'll be able to operate for summer seasons or not based on your like tiered thing? Well, we kind of have an idea four or five weeks in advance. So again, it's the, the tiered thing was guidance that came out from the federal government that is either going to be adapted at the state and even county level. So you and because there's that piece, it's not either or those three things, it's all three of those things. So it requires that the hospital and pre-hospital infrastructure be ready for reopening. And so it's only going to be a local decision. And to get from phase one to phase two to phase three, it's two weeks on each of, um, on each of those. So you're gonna have to have two weeks of declining cases to get to phase one. Some places are already at phase one, but then it's gonna be two weeks to get to phase two. And I see the comment that New York City canceled all pools for 2020, Minnesota did as well. And that's going to be the reality. And more and more states are, are extending their shelter in place orders for, um, for, for longer and longer. And the reality is we are operating right now in an almost complete lack of federal guidance. And it has just completely been delegated to the states. And some states have then delegated it to local municipalities. So we are not able to, to say, here's what everybody should do because it's gonna be so uh, dependent on the, the specific uh, everything in your area. Okay, so we've got and a- I, I absolutely- Go ahead. Uh, sorry. So the worker health and safety in Ontario, the U.S. equivalent is OSHA. And again, OSHA requires that you be able to provide your firefighters going into burning buildings need to have equipment. Your lifeguards who are healthcare responders, the appropriate equipment. But the only change is known or suspected COVID. And so if you're screening out known or suspected, that just means known or suspected. We're seeing people with sprained ankles who later develop COVID, but we didn't test them because they weren't known or suspected and we all had some risk of exposure to them. So if you're screening out the, um, the known or suspected, then you're operating within safe guidelines. And that's gonna be happening at the door of the facility or entrance of the establishment, most likely, right? And again, and that is just well, that's most likely. And again, that's 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 my interpretation and where I anticipate that we are going to to go with our clients to allow for that uh, for that safe opening and for that um, and and for that because a lifeguard shouldn't be put in a position where somebody has a COVID cardiac arrest just hanging out at the snack shack at their facility. Like if, again, if that's the case, then our lifeguards need full PPE, masks, gowns, face shields, and we opened too early. Okay, so we're gonna do one or two more questions because I wanna start wrapping this up. Um, again, thank you, Justin. While people are still watching, let's hit a thank you in the chat for Justin. Um, for coming on and as always sharing your expertise. We have a question here from Judith about N95 and first aid kits. Do you think we'll start stocking those? 
Um, so N95 masks require specific training and certification to use. When all of this hit, one of the first regulations from OSHA to go out the window was um, fit testing to make sure that the, uh, the masks are appropriate as well as, um, uh, as well as the ability to reuse them. I do see a possibility that we've screened at the door for everybody. And then we still have that person who has a COVID cardiac arrest at the, uh, at the snack shack. And it might be that we have that emergency PPE that's in our first aid response bag so that if we are responding to a known or suspected COVID, not the drowning, not the sprained ankle, not those other you know slip and falls, but somebody who is a known or suspected, because as you go to approach and, and are checking scene safety, somebody says he was just diagnosed with COVID and discharged from the hospital yesterday, and we wanted to, to come have uh, a row in the lazy river, then you know that's what you're faced with. So that's going to require training on the proper use of that um, of that equipment. And I see a lot of comments as well about what about natural bodies of water? What about places that you can't control who comes in at the gate? That is society at large right now. And those calls are being screened by the 911 centers and are either being stratified into somebody just went out in the water to try and kill themselves after getting diagnosed with COVID. We're going to respond very differently than they were asymptomatic. They were fine. They haven't had any symptoms. They haven't had any exposures. They got drunk and went on a boat. And then, and then you're responding. So again, we are still screening those people through the 911 access centers. And if it's an uncontrolled recreational setting like a beach in Florida that opens in a couple hours starting today, that, um, that again, we're assuming those are non-suspected or known COVID patients. Okay, great. And then one other quick note on the uh, the presentation. So when I showed the presentation, it was in uh, letterbox or sixteen by nine format. So if you had your display set at four to three, then that's why it uh, it cut off the uh, the edges. So it will be distributed uh, by Joey as a PDF as uh, as well, and then you'll have all of those uh, those QR codes and um, and links as well on the PDF. That's awesome. Thank you. And, uh, you know, again, Justin, thank you so much. We met quite a few years ago and you've, you've been a good mentor for our industry and your commitment to focusing on, you know, lifeguarding and resuscitation in our environment. So thank you for your time today and the direction and um, insights that you've been providing with us from your perspective on what's happening. Um, I do appreciate that. We've had lots of questions. Um, in the chat. So what you've been saying has been sparking. Some of them are starting to already think about operational things like union and this and that. And those are things that we're going to have to wrestle with as an industry. But this has given us all a lot of let's reset, um, get the right focus here and stop, you know, worrying about all those crazy things like some of my outlandish questions. Um, so again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Last plug for anything you want to say before I cut you out here. Yeah, I, I would just say that the information is evolving. And right now we don't have all of the answers. And the updates that I gave two and four weeks ago were were different than uh, than they are right now. And this information might, uh, might change. And um, it, it really is um, that, that we are doing our best with the information that we have available, both with treatment and prevention um, of this. And if everybody just continues to you know, to, to look for accurate sources of information and, and don't burn down 5G towers. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And you stay safe with your family, okay? All right. Thank you so much, Joey. Thank you guys all for, uh, for joining us. So there you guys have it. Um, thank you for joining our live broadcast here on Lifeguard Authority. Um, thank you for all of your great questions and comments. Um, Jen was 
popping in the discussion about where you can find this later. So the link um, or this video will be downloaded on our thread in the group here. But uh, hopefully if you're in other aquatic networks, when you see that, um, share it with those networks so that we can get more and more aquatic professionals connected with some of this information. I'll also be posting it on the YouTube channel for communities outside of Facebook to have access to do that. Um, I welcome you to invite your friends to join our aquatic community here. The group on Facebook is a place where we can help aquatic professionals connect um, and start collaborating on things. You've seen a lot of opportunities for collaboration in our chat box here today about some creative solutions for training and operations and what's going on with unions and screening and all of those things. Let's work on this together and then let's contribute. Let's let's push that out to the industry and help, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So that's why more people in our communities are gonna bring more dynamics and fresh ideas to what we're doing. A big thank you to Justin. Um, I wanna say thank you to Stargard Elite. Um, for helping connect me with Justin throughout this process and the work that you guys are doing and leading by example with um, your direction to your clients. I think it's a great model for the industry to follow. So to all of you listening, stay safe, stay away from your friends for now, stay connected online if you can and uh, be well. Take care everyone.